It lies in the shadow of the Koolau mountain range, a narrow, melancholy road with a sometimes violent history. In modern days, with tales of urban legends, the road was mislabeled Morgan's Corner, even though it had nothing to do with Dr. Morgan. The misunderstanding might have been because of directions given to thrill seekers and ghost hunters who were told to look for a twisting road with hairpin turns that led to the Pully Lookout. Today it's known as the second Morgan's Corner. I like to call it the Green Mile and a Half. Today, we bring you to Kiona Ole Road. Beyond the cool waters and trade winds of our idealistic paradise is the thin veil which separates our world from the place where the shadows talk back. Welcome to Hawaii's Most Haunted. Originally, that stretch of road was used as a footpath that dated back as far as 1837. And then it was improved to accommodate horses and carriages, eventually widened to become a real road to accommodate vehicles. Everyone that came across the Nu'uanupali from the Honolulu or Windward side traveled that stretch. In 1887, the government paid for the road to be improved, creating what we know today as the Pali Road. During construction, remains, human skulls, and other bones were found and then reburied at the bottom of the cliff under tons of earth. Those were the remains of Kalani Kupule's warriors from the Battle of Nu'uanu. The New Pali Road drastically improved the passageway between the leeward and windward side. In 1986, city officials decided to close most of this stretch of road. After the building of Castle Junction, most commuters still used Kiona Ole Road to bypass the major intersection on their way to the Pali Highway but city officials said that the road had become a haven for troublemakers and criminals. The fire chief at the time first proposed that the road be closed at night, citing over a dozen calls for alarms ranging from fatal accidents and a gang fight to brush fires in the preceding two years. The police department agreed to wanting the road closed with the Windward District Commander stating that the department had been called to the road more times than he could recall. The commander described the road as a lover's lane that has attracted peeping toms and worse. Cars have been set on fire, other kids joyride, cars flip over, resulting in fatalities. He also stated that there have been multiple rape cases, including more than one homicide. In 1983, the nude body of 20-year-old Normala Weddle was found strangled near the Pulley Golf Course one Sunday morning. The medical examiner said Weddle had either been raped or had sexual intercourse before being killed, and that she was strangled with a hard object, not human hands. Police recovered her tire iron from the murder scene, possibly used in the killing. Normala was found strangled with a blunt object and left in the tall grass off Kiono Ole Road after a resident found her purse hanging on a gatepost the next morning. Normala Weddle was dressed in white pants and a white blouse at the time of her disappearance. She left the Waikiki restaurant around 2 a.m. after an argument with her boyfriend. What happened after remains a mystery. After being questioned by the police, her boyfriend was not considered a suspect. Two weeks after her murder, the police finally had a description of a suspect. Normala was seen walking with a man on Kapuhulu Avenue near the Honolulu Zoo parking lot, headed Moka. The suspect was described as an Asian man about 25 years old, five feet, five inches, 140 pounds, with short black hair, wearing a gray suit. By the end of the year, the case had continued to baffle police, and sadly, Normala Weddle has not found justice. Because of its secluded location, Kiona Ole Road, people have been brought to that stretch of road to be beaten, robbed, and murdered. Before Normala Weddle's murder, many of you will still recall the 1975 story of Don Bustamante, who was also kidnapped and murdered on that short stretch of road. That short mile and a half of road has seen more death than most of the roads in our state. Gates have been erected in hopes to keep the unwary traveler out. Coming down the old Pali Road, high up on the Ko'olau side of Nu'uanupali, 
The road hesitated for a few yards on a level plain, then forked and plunged downward two ways to the sea. Turning right onto Old Kalaniana Ole Highway, now an extension of Aulua Road, would bring you towards Kailua and Waimanalo. Staying on the Old Poly Road portion, which is now Kiano Ole Road, would bring you to the beginning of Kamehameha Highway. Not many people nowadays will remember this, but at that junction stood a halfway house, a neat little greenhouse that the city erected in place of the original crumbling shack. It was the home of Charlie Kaulaloha, the hermit of the Pali. Charlie painted a sign on the door that read, Kuuhome na Pali hauliuli o ke ko'olau. The green Pali of the ko'olau is mine. Better known as Hemokapa Pali, for doffing his hat to every carriage and vehicle that passed him, Charlie was the Pali Road maintenance man for almost 30 years. His official city title was Cantoneer. A 1929 newspaper story about him said, Everybody who has gone down the Pali Road probably has seen Charlie. He's a lean, brown Hawaiian man with a face as rugged and as ageless as the mountains that rise above the road. If one is passing casually, one may notice that the old man raises his battered straw hat and bows. It didn't matter whether Charlie knew them or not. Whenever someone passed him on the road, Charlie would straighten up from his shovel to raise his hat and smile to the passerby. Charlie would wake up in the middle of the night and start his job at 2 a.m., keeping the pulley road clear of clay and rocks that fell from the hills above. Six days a week, he traversed the pulley road, making his way up the steep grade with his sledgehammer and shovel and broom. If the rocks were too big to be lifted, Charlie would break them with his sledge before pushing them over the edge of the road to crash into the brush below. No one from the city told Charlie that he had to be at work at two o'clock in the morning. It was his own idea. If a motorist should find the road blocked by fallen rocks, it would pain Charlie deeply. By 7 a.m., motorists would find the road smooth and clean. In the daytime, Charlie would tend to his flowers. Long ago, before anyone else gave a thought to beautifying the rugged roadside, Charlie found wildflowers in the valley below his house and coaxed them into growing in the ditches. By 1929, almost the entire roadside was lined with color. The outdoor circle even furnished Charlie with flowers and shrubbery and ferns. As the sun made its way down below the cliffs, Charlie would make one more trip over the top, just to make sure that there are no rocks or clay on the road that runs from the clouds to the sea. And then he retired to his lonely little house on the cliff. On Saturdays, Charlie went to town where he stayed with his wife, who was taking care of her aged mother. Sometimes on a Saturday night, even as he lay snuggled in his bed in town, storms and trade winds would cause him to worry, thinking relentlessly of huge boulders blocking his road. By 1935, Charlie told another newspaper reporter that a lot of the fun had gone from his work with the advent of modern sedan cars. In the days of horse-drawn carriages and open vehicles, he would collect hats that travelers were always losing in the gusty pulley gales. He stored the hats in his house where they would be returned if their owners came back to claim them, but many hats weren't called for. Plenty of friends in those days, recalled Charlie. They used to choose hats to fit them from the collection. But today, no more hats, fewer friends. Charlie's wife had passed away, and six of his children lived in the city. Charlie lived alone in his little greenhouse, only traveling to the city twice a month to collect his pay. In 1935, Charlie was the oldest and highest paid laborer in the city services, making 55 cents an hour. City officials knew him as Charlie Cantoneer. In 1937, Charlie worked a full day as usual, then discarded his laboring clothes and donned his Sunday best. His bed had not been slept in and his house was immaculate. At just 68 years old, Charlie was found hanging from a rafter in the tool shed behind his house by a fellow laborer who called on Charlie every morning 
on his way to work. Charlie left no note, and he hadn't communicated his intentions to even his closest friend. The autopsy revealed that he died of strangulation and that he suffered from chronic heart disease. Authorities believe that his illness may have furnished the motive for suicide. The halfway house stood empty for a number of years. A few people moved into Charlie's old house for brief periods, including an army sergeant and his family. Over the years, the halfway house became known as the haunted house. The little greenhouse was dismantled in 1949, but ghost stories about the area persisted and became part of the rich lore of the Pully. As predicted in a 1929 newspaper article, the true story of the life and times of Charlie Kalauloha has drifted into the limbo of forgotten realities.